Welcome to Investing Insights. I'm your host, Ivana Hampton. Does dividend investing create bad investor behavior? This strategy can split investors into two camps, those in favor and those against. Here's how it works. A company will pay out part of its earnings to stock owners, typically quarterly. Those dividends can arrive as a check in the mail or cash in a brokerage account. Critics say this isn't a bonus, but a cut into the total return. But income-focused investors don't seem to mind. David Harrell is the editor of Morningstar's Dividend Investor Newsletter. We talked about the psychology of dividends. Welcome back to the podcast, David. Thanks for having me back. Let's start with why dividend investing has divided so many investors. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure if investors are divided. You know, as an editor of a dividend-oriented newsletter, certainly I hear from dev, uh, investors that are very pro-dividend investing. Uh, but I think if investors are divided or maybe sometimes confused, it's because they're getting mixed messages about dividends. So if you read the you know sort of financial headlines, you you see the news. Like earlier this year, I think we spoke about. Uh, you had some big name companies initiating dividends for the first time, Meta Platforms and Alphabet. And in often cases, like that was praised as a good thing. You see headlines about dividend increases, and that's generally viewed as positive. Uh, there's this whole idea of dividend growth investing by identifying companies that are growing their dividends at a regular pace. Uh, that's indicative of companies with you know strong growing earnings. Um, so that's considered a positive. Uh, and there's this, also this idea that dividend stocks can be defensive in recessionary periods. Uh, so those are all sort of pro-dividend messages. Uh, at the same time, you often see stories about how, well, dividends are an inefficient way for companies to return cash to their shareholders, and that maybe investors are irrational in pursuing a dividend-focused strategy as opposed to a total return-based strategy. So for those reasons, you know, for that reason, I kind of feel that. Um, I know investors are divided, but sometimes they're getting two stories there and they're not maybe sure what's going on with dividends. Good point. So talk about a couple of pitfalls that income-focused investors should be aware of. I mean, there's dividend fallacy. What's going on there? Okay. So the dividend fallacy, uh, if if you'll bear with me, so we're only a couple weeks past Halloween. So maybe you've got some Halloween candy floating around your house still. Yes. Okay, so so let's let's say that you and I went trick or treating, and we each have some of those full size candy bars left. Those are the best. Yeah. So and and let's say that my candy bar, full size candy bar, same as yours, represents a share of a one stock share for a dividend paying company. You have the same candy bar, but yours is going to represent a non dividend paying stock. Now the dividend fallacy comes into play where this idea that I have my chocolate bar. And when I get my dividend, it's like in addition to my full-size chocolate bar, I'm getting one of those little mini chocolate bars. Bite-size. Now the bite size. So now I've got my full size and my bite size. You've only got your full size, so I've got more chocolate than you. So I'm, I'm better off than you. And what investors don't realize is that stock prices do adjust for those dividends that are paid. So I might have a full-size bar and a bite size, but my full-size bar has shrunk just a little bit. And I have the same amount of chocolate as before. So you and I have the same amount of chocolate, but my fallacy is that I've got a little piece that you don't have. So I somehow have more. Mm -hmm. So so the challenge here, of course, is that, you know, stocks aren't candy bars. Stock prices go up, they go down. So those candy bars are always shrinking or growing, hopefully. So you might not realize it, that uh, this dividend payment has caused caused a little bit of a shrinkage for you. Uh, but in fact, it does. And that really is the dividend fallacy that you're sort of getting the dividend payment on top of the capital gain. Uh, and so that the dividend paying stocks will always be giving you more in total. And that's not necessarily the case. There's the dividend fallacy also can um, occur when people think about the defensive nature of dividend stocks. So there is a case that dividend paying stocks are defensive because the types of stocks that pay dividends, they tend to be large cap, more value oriented companies, established firms uh, from certain sectors. So when you have a broad market downturn, those sectors sometimes hold up a little better. So there's a defensive component to the dividend stock. But I sometimes hear people say, well, the dividend payment 
dampens volatility. And that's sort of a second order dividend fallacy because uh, the dividend payment also did result in a change in the share price. Uh, so it's, it's fair to say that dividend stocks in certain recessionary environments can be defensive, uh, but the idea that the dividend payment is what's dampening volatility is, is not correct. And what about dividend traps? I mean, yields can look too good to be true, but that's typically a warning signal, right? It can be. So, I mean, and this is really the danger of, of buying stocks based, you know, on one metric or one number. So you're looking at a stock and, you know, stock A is yielding 3.5% and stock B is yielding 6%. And you're like, oh, well, I'm going to buy stock B. It must be a better a better purchase, and it could be, uh, but sometimes uh, there are what what you refer to as dividend traps, and this is a situation where, if we think about how yield is calculated, it's a very simple calculation. It's the current dividend rate of the stock divided by the share price. Uh, but if that share price starts to crater, to go down, uh, because the denominator is getting smaller and smaller, the resulting yield is going to be higher and higher. So. If you see a high yielding stock, it could just be a you know a, a great company that's paying out a lot of its earnings as as a dividend, and it could be a good investment. It could also be a company that has uh, seen its its yield sort of being pushed up by a declining share price. That declining share price price might represent some fundamental challenge to the company's business model, and it might even indicate that there's a dividend cut coming in the future. Uh, so buying on yield alone. Uh, can be a dangerous uh, strategy. And a popular argument is that investors should be indifferent to a company's dividend policy. Explain why. So, you know, sort of think about, you know, how you make money from stocks. So there's really two components here. One is the capital gain. So you, you buy the share for $100, it goes up to $200. You have then you can sell and you, you realize a $100 gain. You can also uh, receive dividends from the stock, and that obviously counts in your favor as part of your total return. The sort of argument that investors should be indifferent is not a new one. There was a you know, landmark paper on this in 1961. But really, the idea is that investors should be focused on total return instead of um, dividends alone. And that dividends, if you really need current income, you always have the option to create your own dividend by selling some of your shares. Um, and that you can do so at the time of your choosing, whereas dividends are coming quarterly, whether or not you want them. Um, so, so that's the it's a surprise part of the, it's not the dividend policy, but it's the idea that a dollar is a dollar, whether it comes from a dollar of dividends or it comes from you realizing a dollar by selling a share or a portion of a share. And you've written a column in Morningstar's Dividend Investor Newsletter that supported a dividend-focused investment strategy. You pointed out that investors could sidestep the safe withdrawal rate dilemma. Talk about that. Well, I'm not an expert on withdrawal rates. I'll leave that to colleagues like Christine Benz and such. I guess my point there was that, you know, uh, people often reference the Trinity study, which shows that a 4% withdrawal rate is a safe withdrawal rate for a 30-year time period. Uh, but then there's a lot of discussion about that is like, well, what if you have a 40-year uh Retirement period, expected retirement. Would have, what if um, price multiples are very high right now? All, all sorts of things. And I'm not advocating this necessarily as you know this is be all and end all for an investment strategy. But it does sidestep sort of the issue of of making withdrawals. That if you have a, a diversified portfolio of dividend stocks that's providing a yield of say 3.5 or 4%, uh, you are essentially able to get that amount of income from the portfolio without having to make uh, sell decisions on an ongoing basis. And you mentioned this earlier, the idea of creating your own dividend. Why do you think some folks may not find that as appealing? I think it's there, there's some, a lot of psychology here, and and one is that you know uh, you know you get the check in the mail or you get the dollars showing up in your brokerage statement with a dividend, uh, and it's sort of taken out of your hands. Uh, there's you know I have plenty of 
investment or sort of decision regret when it comes to investing. Um, so you do have that option of creating your own dividend at any time. You can sell a share. Uh, you can sell fractions of shares now very, very easily with many brokerage platforms. So you always have this option to create income by selling shares of stocks that you own. Uh, but that sort of creates a whole other set of questions. You know, which shares do you sell from your portfolio? Then do you have subsequent decision regret because, oh, I sold those shares and now those shares have gone up. And um, I'm not suggesting in any way that you settle for a suboptimal strategy or anything like that, but simply saying from a psychological standpoint, dividend investors don't face those questions because they are receiving that regular income from their portfolio without having to um, to sell to sell shares. And we've talked before about dividend stocks versus the broader market. And Morningstar has done research that shows why investors may want to think long term when comparing performance. What do you say? Well, yes, um, it, it's you, I was recently looking at the Robert Schiller numbers, which date back to the late uh, 1800s. Uh, so we have a very long term record of U.S. large cap companies in terms of their earnings, how their earnings have grown and the dividends that they've paid out on a monthly basis going back you know, basically 150 years. And if you look at the dividends as a portion of earnings, uh, we're in a different place today than we were you know, in the midpoint of the 20th century, for example, where companies are paying out a smaller portion of their earnings as dividends. And there's, there's, there's multiple factors here. One is the rise of buybacks or share repurchases as a way of returning cash to shareholders. And it's also um, that, you know, over the past 10, 15, 20 years, uh, you know, sort of a lot of the market capitalization and U.S. equity returns have been driven uh, by these mega cap growth companies, uh, you know, tech and communication services firms that have opted not to pay dividends. So, you know, you can slice and dice it in many different ways. Uh, I know there's some Kenneth French data uh, that Morningstar's indexes team cited in a study looking from the late 20s through 2023, and they found that higher yielding stocks actually had the best return uh, and beat that over the broad market. I was looking at a shorter time period, uh, the 20-year period that ended in uh, 2023, and dividend stocks or dividend indexes did slightly outperform the broad market. But if you look at rolling returns for the past 30 years, particularly the past you know, five or 10 years, we see that the broad market has outperformed uh, a, a dividend-focused portfolio or index, and precisely because a lot of that market return has been driven uh, you know, by some of these, these big name tech and communication services firms, uh, which until recently, many of them were not paying dividends. Uh, but as we spoke about before, you know, we now have um, meta platforms, Alphabet uh, paying dividends. And I think if you look at the top 10 companies by market capitalization right now, Amazon.com might be the only holdout for paying a dividend. Now, keep in mind that the that the, the yields of these companies is relatively low, uh, below 1% for you know, um, Apple, Microsoft, um, Alphabet, and Meta platforms. Uh, so they're not typically going to show up in a dividend-focused portfolio or uh, dividend index, uh, but we are seeing you know, uh, more companies paying dividends at this point, at least relative to where we were even a year ago. Are share repurchases a better way to return capital stock Owners, they well. The argument there is that uh, share repurchases are a more efficient way of returning cash to shareholders. So, if you own a dividend-paying stock in a taxable account, uh, if it's a qualified dividend, at the very least, you're going to pay the capital gains rate, tax rate on on that dividend. Um, so, even if you reinvest the share and reinvest your shares, you're going to have a tax bill for that. With share repurchases, where the company takes their cash and instead of distributing it as a dividend to shareholders, uh, they instead buy shares from the market. Uh, they reduce their share count. And how this benefits 
the remaining shareholders is that now there are fewer shares to spread their earnings sort of across. Uh, so in theory, all else being equal in terms of uh, the price multiple, you should see a corresponding increase in the share price. So in that sense, as a shareholder, you benefit because now your shares are worth a little bit more, but there's no tax implication until you go to sell those shares. Uh, so that's why uh, people will say that buybacks or repurchases are more tax efficient relative to dividends. So let's turn the tables now. What are a couple of points that you can make against a dividend-focused investment strategy? Sure. Well, I, I think, you know, the main one would be the one I mentioned earlier, where investors are attracted to companies based solely on the yield. They're not looking at valuation. Uh, they're not looking at, you know, potential earnings growth or anything else. They're just saying, wow, 5%, 6% yield, you know, let me buy that. Um, the second is that you could, uh, in pursuit of yield, assemble a portfolio uh, that doesn't capture some of the areas of the market where where future returns might be greater. Uh, that you're very light in some of the you know industries or sectors that are going to pro provide the greatest total return going forward. Now, what that is, we don't know. Um, so, I, I would say that's sort of the main drawback. Uh, and then, if you are years away from retirement and you don't need the current income, there is the there is the tax inefficiency argument there. Um, but I would, you know, back back away from that by saying that, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, or at least perhaps I do, too much time looking at, well, you know, what are dividend strategies doing relative to the broad market? And first of all, I have heard from, you know, subscribers and such that you're know, like, I, I don't really care about the broad market. I, I you know, I'm, I'm looking to fund my retirement and, and I have a growing stream of dividends and it does that. And I'm happy with that. Uh, so, so that's that's one point. But I think also is that we don't invest sort of in the abstract, you know, and, and the idea is, yes, you want to maximize your total return. Uh, but the success of an investor is based on several things. And, and one of them is their behavior. And um, I, I don't think we need to come down hard on one side or the other in that if pursuing a dividend-focused investment strategy causes you to maximize your savings and investment and it gets you to your goals, then it's, that's, that's a, a perfect strategy for you. Um, if a strategy that you're not focused on current income but rather total return – if that gets you to your goals, uh, you know that's a that's a great outcome as well. Um, so I, I think we spend a lot of time in the abstract. You know, dividends did they outperform? Dividend stocks outperform or underperform the broad market, uh, and perhaps less attention to do investors behave in such a way because of the stocks that they want to purchase? Do they behave in such a way that allows them to reach their financial goals? So. I was going to pose this question to okay. you, but I think you just answered it because I started the show asking whether dividend investing is creating bad investor behavior. But what say you? I think it occasionally does in individual purchases where people uh, purchase for yield alone. Uh, but I wouldn't say that it necessarily creates bad investor behavior. And then, you know, we are looking at historical time periods and you know, in, in uh, the vast majority of sort of the data that we have looking over the 20th century, uh, dividends were a very large component of total return. We've seen less of that in recent years, uh, but I wouldn't want to necessarily predict, you know, what we're going to see in the future. Uh, but I, I think it doesn't have to be uh, an either or approach that investors who desire current income, who want the stability of, of, a, of a, the cash flow from a dividend portfolio, it makes perfect sense for. Uh, and that might you know, be a great investment strategy for them. Uh, and if, they, if, if that doesn't appeal to them, they don't have to pursue a dividend strategy, but we can have, we can have good outcomes in both, it, with both uh, approaches. So pick what's going to keep you motivated. I think so. And I think that's the, you know, one thing about dividends is that, you know, investors, you know, the very active investing is you're, you're foregoing current consumption uh, to fund some future goal, be it retirement or children's college education, you know, whatever that might be. And it's sort of, 
sometimes hard to stay motivated because it's something that's you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the line. Uh, one thing about dividends is it's a very tangible uh, sort of there's a, there's this tangible aspect to investing. You start to receive an income stream, and you can sort of match that income income stream to maybe some of your liabilities. And I've seen you know on, on social media like, well, now my dividend, my month my quarter my monthly dividend payments now they pay for my phone bill. Next month I'm going to have enough. They're going to pay for my, my my car payment or something like that. Uh, so it's it's causing you know positive investor behavior because they're motivated uh, to 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 increase that dividend stream for themselves. Uh, so I think that's a very positive uh, aspect of dividends. Again, you know you can you could possibly do the same thing by uh, creating your own dividend, uh, but I don't think investors. Uh, because it's less tangible, I, I, I don't think we, I don't see the same excitement uh, from that from the create your own dividend uh, that you do with some uh, dividend enthusiasts. Well, David, thank you for coming to the table and explaining the psychology behind dividends. Thanks for having me. That wraps up this week's episode. Thanks for watching and making this show part of your day. Subscribe to Morningstar's YouTube channel to see new videos about investment ideas, market trends, and analyst insights. Thanks to senior video producer, Jake Van Kersen, and associate multimedia editor, Jessica Bebel. I'm Ivana Hampton, lead multimedia editor at Morningstar. Take care.